Good evening, class, and welcome to this uh, Wednesday night Bible study um, by the Antioch Church of Christ. I'm Michael Whittington. I preach for the church there. And with me on the panel are the same uh, group of folks that, um, that were with us last Wednesday. Uh, we have um, Jonathan J.P. Parker is our new youth director. Uh, officially, we'll take you know, his spot during ABC next week. But uh, he and Megan and uh, Emmett, his little baby boy, and Lily, his four-year-old daughter, they're moving here on 1 August. So Jonathan, JP, welcome, my friend. Um, we have Cheryl Friend. Cheryl is the receptionist for the church there, for the, for the office, but does so much more. She is the, the glue, I think, that holds everything together. And it's always a blessing for me to have you in the class, Cheryl, and, and participating. So thank you, sister. Um, we have Ken Harmon. And Ken is also one of our Bible school teachers and um, has been a preacher in the past and, and one of uh, my, my friends and a well-read, he's well-read in scripture. And we have uh, also Ken, so we're going to call him Kenneth, as we did last week during this, so I could separate Kenneth and Cam. But Kenneth Cunningham is also um, well-read in the Bible and a godly man, has taught classes before and uh, has certainly helped me. Uh, in the home improvement class that I teach on Sunday morning, uh, pre-pandemic, and will continue post-pandemic. So anyway, thank you all for attending, not only for these four, but for all of you online. God bless you. We are talking about the, the five criteria that God uses to, to judge all nations, but clearly in this case, the criteria that God uses to judge, um, to judge America. And it's really coming from the text in Acts 17, where the Bible says, where Paul is addressing the Athenian philosophers, and he says, he said that God uh, has formed every nation on earth and allotted their uh, certain periods of time for their existence and has um, determined the boundaries of their habitation in order for them to seek God and to feel after God, and to find God. So I believe, and th that the Bible teaches, that God has formed all the nations. We say in the Pledge of Allegiance, we are one nation under God, but in fact, every nation is under God. Whether they know it or not, they are being evaluated, judged, and I think blessed, and perhaps in some cases cursed by God based upon what they do as a people. If they're an evil people, God will curse them. He will, we don't use that word anymore, but God will remove his blessings from them. If they're a righteous people, God will bless them. I believe that America, clearly our history, has been one of righteousness, that we were uh, founded with the Judeo-Christian uh, core. Uh, that's our heritage, uh, loving God, loving others, um, you can't go through the halls of the government buildings in our capital in D.C. without realizing that all of our history is based on the Old and New Testament. You know, so with that in mind, we've been asking the question, uh, how does God judge America? And we've come up with five criteria. The first criterion was the righteousness criterion. Proverbs 14, 34. The second was seeking God, Acts 17, 27. The third uh, was whether or not the nation, a nation, uh, welcomes uh, God's people, uh, blessing Israel, uh, the church as well, being the spiritual Israel. The fourth criterion was, do we proclaim the gospel as a people, as a, as a nation? Do we proclaim the good news of Christ? The fifth is, is what I call the dominion uh, criterion based on Genesis 126. Let us make man in our image and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, the cattle, and over all the earth. Asking the question, does this particular nation that God is judging, in this case we're talking about our own nation, the United States, how well do we care for his creation? So anyway, those are the five criteria. We've, this is our third Wednesday night. 
We talked about righteousness, Proverbs 14, 34. And we addressed seeking God. We're so, and so tonight, I thought we would um, kind of blend the two together, seeking God and does our nation as a whole, do we uh, receive, do we welcome, do, do we uh, bless God's people as a, as a nation? Uh, once again, we can, our panel can go back to their own, uh, to our own American history, or they can bring up something of the, of the present day, uh, tie it with scripture. And, um, and so let's, um, let's, let's start right there. So you guys can just jump in anytime you want. Go ahead. We need to start with a prayer, I believe. So. A little bit louder, Ken. We need to start with a prayer, so I think maybe we should start right there. You're absolutely right. Where was I? Um, I I'd actually said that okay, prior to the recording. I said, Ken, you're going to lead us in prayer. And so bless your heart. Yes, let's ask God's blessings to be on this. Thank you, Ken. Father God, we acknowledge your dominion over this world. We acknowledge your dominion in our lives. We're grateful, Father, for your wisdom and your guidance in each day that we live. We pray that we may always seek your face and strive to live according to your principles. Father, we especially pray for this world at this time, for the pandemic that is afflicting so many people. We pray, Father, that good will come from this and perhaps there will be awakening of spiritual needs as a result of the harsh problems that we're facing right now. We pray, Father, for the social unrest that we're seeing in this country with race issues, that you would be with us and help us to reconcile these matters and, and come to a better understanding of how we ought to love one another and, and, and be a blessing to one another in this life. Bless this class tonight and may we reach out to one another and reach out to those that are listening uh, with your word and with, with your truth to uh, help us all to have a better understanding of what you desire of us and what you desire of this nation. We make this prayer in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Amen, Ken. Thank you for the reminder, please. That was absolutely, we needed that. Um, first mistake I've made all day, so that's not too bad. Hold it against you. <laughs> okay. Um, uh I wanted to start because as you ended last week, you were talking about voting. You were encouraging people to vote. And I did want to mention that, that that is one part, of, to me, that's part of the criteria that God is going to judge us by. We as Christians, especially in Romans 13, are told to be good citizens, to be obedient to the powers that be and to recognize, Paul says, that they were put there by God. And so that we should should obey them. So. I think that God is going to judge us by the kind of citizens that we are. If he's judging America, he's certainly judging us for the way that we put forth our Christian practices, but he judges us as, as good citizens as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, it's hard to separate these criteria. I know that. Um, and so really we don't have to, as long as everyone in the class, understands that uh, God is judging us based on righteousness, seeking God. I think whether or not we welcome the church, we receive God's people, um, whether we proclaim the gospel, you know, take, take the word of God to other nations as well. Uh, so we can, we can blend it all together. That, that's, that's just fine. Let me... Um, um, Last week, I shared about five or six things from our history. I'll, I just want to share one more, and I think that will feed us into this discussion. Uh, if you were to go to, um, to Washington, D.C. right now, you'll notice in the Senate chamber, on the south entrance of the chamber, uh, inscribed above are the, are, is, the, is the motto now for America, and has been for, for decades, uh, but right there in the Senate building, in God we trust. Um, I don't know how many people in America uh, actually know that, that our capital uh, is filled with um, inscriptions 
from Holy Scripture. And it's based on the fact that we were, we were founded, um, if not as a Judeo-Christian nation, then clearly as a nation wanting to elevate religious freedom. In fact, the First Amendment, the first clause of the First Amendment is religious freedom to give us the opportunity to worship God uh, without the government intervening. And we have that today. In fact, we fall on it all the time. We, um, we really seek it. So I talked about the, the positive of last week. I'm going to read a text, and I think that will open up discussion with the entire group. Um, I think the, th there's a remarkable sequence of sins listed in Leviticus 18, verses 20 through 25 that I think sound very similar to the world that we live in. Not just this great nation, um, but the world we live in. And I know that these sins that uh, Leviticus uh, identifies have become extremely controversial. And I just want to remind all of us in the Bible class, everyone listening to it for the first time online, and those of us uh, on the panel, um, that we want to speak the speak truth to power and speak, and, and power is not just government power. Power is maybe even a politically correct culture. Power is a group of people who wield power, regardless who they may be. But we want to speak loving truth to power. Um, so anyway, I'm going to read this just as it is in scripture, and then we can, we can talk about it. Uh, I'm actually drop, leave one verse because I don't think it pertains right now, but I'll start with verse 20. Uh, and you shall not lie carnally with your neighbor's wife or defile uh, yourself with her, talking about adultery. You shall not give any of your children to devote them uh, by fire. They were actually having uh, human sacrifices of the, of the babies uh, to a false god, Bullock. And so profane the name of your God, I am the Lord. In verse 22, you shall not lie with a male as with a woman. It is an abomination. Then he says in verse 24, do not defile yourself by any of these things. For by all these, the nations I am casting out before you defiled themselves. And the land became defiled so that I punished its iniquity, and the land vomited out its inhabitants. There are at least three sins. There are really four. The fourth was bestiality, and we can even talk about that if, it, if you want, uh, but I, this, is, this is how I believe, not just America, but in the world we live in, what was unheard of uh, years ago is, is acceptable today, it seems like. Um, and number one, it's, it's not that the world has never committed adultery. I mean, this was, we're going back to Leviticus, and you could, you could, you know, all of humanity. It's that they did not glamorize it, you know, as such God's people didn't. And so I believe we're talking about uh, adultery in the sense that, that no one thinks the second thing about it, that you could have any sort of a, of a, of a sexual sin, and and the in our culture today just accepts it, you know, receives it, no problem whatsoever. Um, it's still, by the way, as an aside, I know Ken uh, Cunningham was a was a military person, and perhaps Kenneth uh, uh, Ken Harmon as well, and uh, Jonathan. I don't know if you've served in the military or not, but the um, but in the Uniform Code of Military Justice adultery is still a punishable offense. I know it was when you were in, Kenneth, mm -hmm. and it was when I was in, correct? Yes. Yeah. And I believe it still is today. Now, whether or not they follow through with it is, is different. I'm not sure. But so I want to 
not specify the sin of adultery, but just talk, talk about the, the sexual proclivity of the culture versus how it was when the country began. Um, and abortion, I think, could he, you know, um, I think that's one of the three, this is Whittington speaking, but I believe that abortion is one of the three most national blights on our history. I think slavery, abortion, uh, and how we treated women wouldn't even give them the right to vote until the early 20th century. But the two most heinous, I believe, are slavery and abortion. So I have often asked myself, is God judging America based on the fact that we abort, we take the lives of the unborn at such an unprecedented, callous, uh, unprecedented rate and with such callousness? And then homosexuality in verse 22. Um, so, uh, what are your thoughts on those three very controversial verses of Scripture? Rick, I wanted to say that, you know, when I was in the Air Force, I was not a Christian. My stepmother had given me a Bible, and I was in actually, a, after basic training, I was at Keystone Air Force Base, and I was reading the Old Testament. I didn't know the difference between the Old and New Testament. But it was here in Leviticus 18, uh, reading through sexual sins and God's death sentence upon sexual sins that really drove me to contact the church. Uh, one of the reasons was, is when I was in 11th grade, uh, my girlfriend had an abortion. So um, this passage is, is very powerful to me. And it was one of the reasons that God opened my eyes to repent and, and to become a Christian. It's quite a testimony, Kenneth. Thank you. So you're saying that Leviticus 18, which is an unusual text for a conversion moment. I mean, that, that, that's remarkable. That shows how, how you were willing to, I mean, dive into the text and, and read. And, that, and, and so you're, you, you are saying that, Levit, that Leviticus 18 was that, that God spoke to you through that text. Yeah, and then uh, soon after that, um, I was stationed in San Antonio and I was actually on a bus going to a mall and I drove down what's called Church's, Church Row. It has about seven different denominations. <laughs> and I noticed the Church Christ. I called the Church Christ. Elder came out and studied with me that night, which happened to be a Wednesday, and we, I was baptized that night. But it was this passage in, in Leviticus 18. Uh, I didn't know I was supposed to be reading New Testament. <laughs> I didn't know what that was. But this was the passage that drove me to realize what a sinner I was wow. and still am. <laughs> wow. Yeah. You know, I'll say when we, I'm oh, sorry, go ahead. Uh, can you first and then, and then JP. Okay. One thing that bothers me, troubles me greatly is that we put all our emphasis on abortion, unwanted pregnancies and, and bring them but we don't emphasize enough that it's sexual promiscuity that causes these unwanted pregnancies. We need to be emphasizing and teaching about this. We're afraid to talk to young people about the fact that, that sex will lead to unwanted pregnancies and we, we have to abort it, we have to abstain from it, and we do not do that. We don't do it in the church and we certainly don't do it in our country. Do you think we goal. used to? Uh, do you feel like things have changed from, from yesteryear? I think maybe we were stronger on it at one point, but I think it was kind of a subject that was taboo to actually talk about. In the church, I think it's always been taboo. Yeah, I think so too. Well, of course, now today, if you, if you bring something up like that, uh, adultery, uh, premarital sex, homosexuality, then you're, you're uh, labeled as a bigot yeah. or... Uh, you discriminate, and, and that's just the culture we live in. And I suppose, I'm sure it's especially hard with our young people. Yeah, JP, you were going to mention something. Was it a, just go ahead? Um, yeah, I was, was going to say, because our, our young people, I think they're in a very unique situation in a position that many of us weren't in, even myself, as prominently in school. 
um, in the sense that they really are um, missionaries in their school um, as Christians because many of their friends have different sexualities, orientations, um, and our kids have to, and our students have to navigate those classmates that maybe we didn't have to as much. You know, maybe it was still there, but um, just the obviousness of it now is out there. Um, and and they don't want to alienate those people. We don't want to alienate them, but we also want to be able to speak the truth about what the Bible says um, in love. Because, you know, God judges all sin, but it, it does seem more prevalent right now in our culture. And I think some of that is due to uh, the TV shows and movies that are being put out there right now. Um, you know, just in the last, even in the last month, some of the stuff that Netflix has put out, um, just some of the reboot shows, um, putting um, different people of orientation and just trying to push that more, uh, to push that as for people to accept it as normal. Um, you know, our kids have to deal and try to, I don't know if rationalize is the right word, but try to deal with and, and talk to those students that, that are in their school. What's the answer to this? I don't know. I'm asking for information. How can we, how can we help? Many groups like the individual, which starts with me. I have to take a stand and I have to tell people how I feel about it. I have to enforce it with my children, my grandchildren. And uh, it may not change in one generation. It may take several generations to, to affect a change, but it can happen. It, this thing didn't happen overnight. We didn't get the way we are today overnight, and we won't turn around and change overnight, but it has to start somewhere. And it starts with us as Christians saying, I will not tolerate this anymore in my life. And, and that's, that's basically it. You know, a couple of weeks ago, I was talking, had on the, on the Wednesday night study, uh, William, Brother Beard. And um, William just kept saying repeatedly, uh, he's African American for those who don't know William, and a godly man, fine Christian. Um, and he just kept saying repeatedly that what we need is what you're saying, Ken. What we need is what the nation needs is the Word of God. Um, I know that when I was growing up as a teenager in the 60s, that there were a lot of people at my school and my neighborhoods who couldn't quote a single Bible text. But if you were to ask them Bible questions that were general, they could answer the questions because they, because the whole culture was imbued with, this, with these Christian values. I mean, they, they knew that certain uh, sexual sins were wrong. Uh, they understood that that language, they, they knew the difference between vulgar language and language that wasn't vulgar. Uh, and it wasn't commonplace. The vulgar language wasn't really commonplace. And I hear it all the times with the, with the GIs and uh, on movies about soldiers. I can tell you um, that even though I was a chaplain for 27 years, I was a combatant for four years from 1968 to 72, and I spent my entire time overseas, and though you would hear profanity, it, it, it was not nearly, from the airmen and the soldiers that I worked with, it was not nearly as commonplace as it is today on the street I live on. So this stereotype of the, of the drunken sailor who cusses all the time, um, Times have changed, and, and, and I, don't know, I don't know really how to help America other than to, to be honest and speak truth. Um, and, and Kenneth, you talked about how, how we're sometimes perceived as bigots, you know, as homophobes. I mean, I wonder if they, if they realize what the Greek is for fear, that, that this whole phobia, which is a Greek word. Uh, and I've wondered uh, how we tack that phobia onto anything that we want to paint somebody in a corner, and it never has made much sense in, in, in our vernacular to 
to call somebody a homophobe literally means they're afraid of homosexuals and there's some kind of fear of homosexuals which is nuts i don't know how else to put it but i don't know how to get over this well you know aren't you so holier than thou aren't you so perfect and the answer is of course i'm not i i also sin we're all in the same leaky boat and how do i know i sin then you introduce the the word of god then you somehow communicate that there is a standard of right and wrong and uh and so but but, but i don't know how to do that well um and i'm just thinking out loud in front of probably a hundred people here so i guess i'll just pass it on to one of you guys go ahead take it help help with it easy it's not always easy to do i uh, i was in in the army military service from 68 to 70 and uh when i was in vietnam there was a man who i didn't was know taking that. and thank you for your service brother i didn't know that thank you go ahead that, that, that was thankful that's enough yeah. uh, but there was a, a man in my barracks who was taking the lord's name in vain he was just just cursing something terrible and i find i just couldn't take it anymore so i went to him i said i'm sorry to interrupt you but i just don't like that kind of talk i'm a christian and i don't like to hear people talk that way about god and he said what are you meaning what what faith are you and i said i'm a member of the church of christ and he said i am too and i said well i guess this was pointless wasn't it <laughs> but you, you you don't know what you're going to run into in this world and, and back in the 70s there was a man i met uh, here in Nashville. He was from up north and he had moved down to Nashville because we are known as the Bible Belt. He wanted to become a preacher. So he felt, I need to move to Nashville. He said, the South is the Bible Belt and Nashville is the buckle of the Bible Belt. So I moved down here so I could be closer to God. And he said, after two months of living down here, I came to the conclusion that if this is the buckle, somebody needs to punish it to, to polish it because it certainly is tarnished and this was back in the 70s and it's even worse I, I hate to think what he would think about our our city today but we have to live our christianity and that's the only thing we can do we may not affect a change again i say overnight but we can affect a change if we simply stand up for our principles yeah wow you know, I don't know if you've all seen the documentary or uh, read the story about Desmond T. Doss, the Medal of Honor recipient, uh, conscientious objector. He wouldn't carry a gun. He saved 75 wounded men uh, in the Battle of Okinawa. And he was such a good example as a Christian that at one point, and this is a true story, at one point they wanted to attack uh, Hacksaw Ridge at a certain time, but Desmond Teen Doss hadn't had time to do his prayers. So he got special permission from the commander to have his prayers, and they held off the battle until Desmond T. Doss was done. Because the other man, because of his faith, they determined that if they went to battle without Desmond T. Doss praying first, that God would not bless their battle. Mm -hmm. And that's going back what Ken and others said that if we could just live our lives in such a committed way uh, with conviction that that'll do a long way for um, having the community see us not as hypocrites, but as people they want to follow and they want to follow Christ. I think uh, that's the key. And Cheryl and JP have mentioned it also. We need to start with ourselves and uh, not slide and, and to be more convicted and show that to other people. And getting back to, to the message about blessing Israel, uh, I think that's at the heart of Jesus' teaching. He said that by this will the world know that you are my disciples, that you have love one for another. I think the love that we extend to other people is at the very heart of how we bless Israel, how we bless others by loving. And I, it, it's the one thing that gives me hope in this world is that I see all around me people that are extending a heart of love to others that are in need. And I, I, 
it, it restores my faith that, that God is still working in people's lives. And, and I think that's an important thing. That is how we bless Israel, is by loving one another and helping one another. And when I share your passion for the book of Romans, further down in chapter 11, of oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God, how unsearchable his judgment and untraceable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor or who has given, first given to him and has to be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. And that, I think, sums up our response to so many things. Yeah, you're absolutely right. In fact, that is a beautiful close. Paul is talking about a very difficult topic in chapters 9, 10, and 11, and I, God's sovereignty. And I just think he closes with that doxology and says, you know, only God knows. And so he just has this beautiful... I mean, I used to have it by memory, but I've forgotten it because I'd have to look it up again. And you just read it, Cheryl. Uh, but but it's, um, it's a beautiful moment. Um, sp speaking of, let's, th that, that's, a, that's a great pivot to the, the third criteria, criterion uh, of blessing Israel. As a reminder, in, in Genesis 12, in verse 3, God tells Abraham, I will bless those who bless you and I will curse those who curse you. What does that mean? Well, I think, and you've mentioned this before, I think it's uh, nations that uh, treat Christians correctly, uh, certainly their spiritual Israel, and I believe also physical Israel. If you look at, uh, and we've talked about this in our class, if you look at Romans 9, 10, and 11, Paul's concern was about physical injury, Israel. He was, he was concerned about the descendants of Abraham. Um, and I think as a nation, if we support both spiritual Israel and physical Israel, uh, that will be blessed. In fact, if you, if you look into Romans eleven twenty five, 25, I don't have it right open in front of me, but it says there'll be a partially hardened, that, that there's a partially hardening, hardening happening to physical Israel or to Israel until all the Gentiles come in. Well, what does that mean to me? That means that at some point there will be a softening of the heart of Israel and Israel, uh, many of them will believe in the Messiah. Uh, and we know it's not talking about uh, just spiritual Israel because if you put the church in place of Israel there, it doesn't make any sense. God's not harden the hearts of the church until all the Gentiles come in. It doesn't. It doesn't flow at all. If you go down farther in the in the chapter, it talks about uh, God's God's promises are irrevocable. The promises He made to Abraham, the descendants of Abraham, are irrevocable. So you know, uh, physical Israel is a secular has a secular government just like the United States. So we can't. That doesn't mean I don't think we always support everything they do, but I think as a country we should prod them into peace with the Palestinians and things that we can, but I think we always have to support them. And I know it's in our politics of the day, uh, a lot of politicians no longer support Israel. And that's I dangerous. Looking, yeah, I, I, I was looking up um, that, that very topic of, 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 of the presidents who have supported Israel since 1948, mm -hmm. when it became a state. Um, President Reagan, this is what he said when he received um, Prime Minister um, uh, Menachem Begin. Um, this, is, this is a direct uh, quote from Reagan, is what he said. He said, um, Israel and America may be thousands of miles apart, but we are philosophically neighbors, sharing a strong commitment to democracy and the rule of law. What we hold in common are the bonds of trust and friendship, qualities that in our eyes make Israel a great nation. No people have fought longer, struggled harder, or sacrificed more than yours, talking to Begin, in order to survive, to grow, and to live in freedom. Shalom to him that is far off, 
and to him that is near. And again, Mr. Prime Minister, welcome to America. He was visiting President Reagan. And um, every president really has welcomed Israel since 1948. Uh, our 33rd president, Harry S. Truman, stated uh, this just prior just before the convention of the National Jewish Welfare Board in 1952, this is what President Truman said, I am proud of my part in the creation of this new state. Our government was the first to recognize the state of Israel. And of course, the trend for showing support has continued all the way to President Trump. Um, so maybe, you know, at least uh, in the books anyway, uh, we've, we've clearly since even before 1948, I think, uh, but maybe when it comes to that criterion, America has, um, has done well. Uh, I'm still not sure, uh, Ken, if I agree, Kenneth, with the physical Israel and Romans 11, but I know that it's really uh, challenging. And so I do believe that, that Israel was God's people and they, they will always be God's people. And it, you're right, that 25th verse, if you plug the word church in, it kind of loses its, its meaning, its context. But I think Paul segues into the way that God had planned for all of Israel and I think in the 26th verse, he's talking about God's people as a synonym, that the, the way for all of God's people to be saved was the olive tree and the grafting in of the Gentiles, the grafting in of Christians into God's people. And so the expression spiritual Israel I think would include God's people, um, those Jews who, who became Christians, and the Gentiles who became Christians. I still think he's making reference to accepting, to receiving Christ as your Savior. But I mean, Paul, yeah. Paul was encouraging the Gentiles not to deal harshly with those that were Jews because his his hope and his ambition was that we as, as christians these gentiles as christians could win those jews back over to christ he said they were god's people from the beginning they've they've had a relationship longer than you have so don't shun them don't push them away but win them to christ with with your openness and with your acceptance of them and i think that's and that's true today that yeah. If, if we are to win the Jewish nation, it is going to be with acceptance, not with rejection. And I certainly want to believe, I mean, first of all, and, and I remind myself, you know, hey, hey, Michael, you're not God. And thank, thank God I'm not God. I don't want to be God. But um, at the very least, we could, we could agree that in Genesis 12 and verse 3, I will bless those who bless you, curse those who curse you, that the Israel, that, that, the, that the descendants of Abraham, whether it's the, by the bloodline, but certainly as Paul indicates, those who, who by faith are descendants of, of Abraham, like that would be us in the body of Christ, the church, that God is judging the nations based on, are you blessing them? Or are you not blessing them? Are you cursing them? Are you, um, are you being violent toward them? Uh, are, are you bigoted toward them? I, I think that's one of the criteria that God uses. Well, I tell you what, I think... I don't even know how long we've been talking about this, but um, but I think we've covered everything that uh, that I thought about covering. Um, well, before I, bef yes. before you finish, I think it's worth mentioning that Romans eleven is followed by Romans twelve, <laughs> and Romans twelve 
is a powerful chapter. One of my close friends, Bonnie Diggs, has said if she could only have one chapter in the whole Bible, it would be Romans 12 because it is, it's so succinct. So, do you have it in front of you, Cheryl? I do. <laughs> Thank you for why, asking. Why don't, why don't you read the first two verses, at least I the will. first two? I will. Therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. I think that is applicable not only to us as individuals, as Americans, as people, as God's people, but it's also applicable to the nations. Absolutely. That... Um, that we as as god's people in america that we need to be so transformed in our lives that we reflect god's love to others and they too want to be a part of it so we started with with us meaning the only way that we're going to affect change in our in our country is for us to change and i think it's a great bookend it's a great close as well the only way that we can affect change in america uh, is if we change. So let's continue to walk with the Lord, to repent of our own sins, to beg God for forgiveness, to help others do the very same, and collectively as God's people in America, that 57% maybe we can grow to be 60, 70, 80. At least we can touch the lives of those who live around us. So with that in mind, I want to say thank you, you for, for helping us here, um, Cheryl and, um, and JP and Kenneth and Ken and all of those of you listening online. Um, and then next week, we'll pick up with the fourth criteria, uh, whether or not we proclaim the gospel. These really kind of just all converge into one. So I might wrap it up next week, but we'll see how the Spirit of God moves it. And we'll, uh, we'll wait for that then. So God bless you. Let's close in a moment of prayer. And, um, and I'll do that for us right now. Righteous God, we thank you for your presence within us. And we thank you for your presence uh, all around us. You permeate the very air we breathe, Father. And so we say thank you. We ask you to help us love you and love each other more. And by so living in that way, we are transformed into the image of your beloved son jesus christ our savior and that is our prayer for us and that is our prayer father for our great nation in the name of christ we ask you to hear our prayer amen so we'll uh, we'll see you next week god bless you